Mark chapter 4 is where we are at. Um, we're going to actually finish this chapter out tonight. We're talking about the one who can control the storm. The one who can control the storm. Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. I promise everybody here has probably heard this passage like umpteen times, which is fine. But my hope is we're going to look at it a little bit differently after this particular message tonight. Verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with them the boat just as he was. Or they took, um, excuse me, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, and he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? They were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? We have a, a new section here beginning in uh, Mark 4. Um, up until this point, Jesus has been giving out a bunch of parables. Parable of the seeds, parable of the sower, parable um, of talking about the kingdom of God, we're moving from parables to things talking about power. In this first section, we have Jesus having the power over nature, having the authority to do what he has. But as we go through in chapter 5, we see he's showing authority once again. He has authority first over nature, then he has authority over demons. The beginning of chapter 5, he uh, cast out the demons um, in that one called Legion. Um, he has authority over sickness, the woman with the issue of blood, and then also over death itself. He has authority over that as he heals Jairus' daughter. But here in Mark 4, 35 through 41, we have a historical story marked by very careful accuracy. Now, in scholarly thought, when we're talking about Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel, um, he said, it is said that, that Peter and Mark worked pretty closely on this because we see a lot of, um, a lot of things that were very relevant um, in this. And, and you can see it just through the detail that's going on here. We have the time of day. It was evening. We have the uh, detail that there was a cushion in the boat. How many of y'all missed the cushion in reading about this, like, wait a minute, it said Jesus was on a cushion. That was one of those things that, you know, you read it and you're like, wait a minute here, that's there. Um, it talks about the place where Jesus slept in the stern, bottom of the boat. The fact that there were other boats around. It talks about the less than flattering picture of the disciples. It's not the kind of thing that you would make up. Their embarrassing fear and lack of faith in verse 40. It was something that was placed in there. So we see this as having the details of something very historical, of things that made an impact for those that were there. Here, God orchestrates a series of events in the lives of the disciples, but he does it with a purpose to increase their faith in the one they should already trust. Why? A lot of reasons their faith was lacking, but also to show who he was and to show that nothing is impossible with God. And, and here's the thing to remember about this passage, and this is really what kind of hit me hard in, in studying this and hearing what a lot of a lot of people had to say about this. This narrative, a lot of times, 
has kind of been interpreted, not incorrectly, but kind of misses the big point. And I, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I'm guilty of it. Here's how the passage, a lot of times, the focus is, is given. That Jesus can calm the storms in our life. And I want to say that. That's not wrong. Jesus absolutely can. Jesus absolutely can. In fact, that is a message of this passage, but it's not the point. This passage isn't about calming storms. The point of this story is about the one who is sovereign and all-powerful. It's focused on the Lord whom demons rightly recognized as God incarnate and that we should fully trust. This passage is about the discipleship's relationship with Jesus. Everything revolves around Christ and that faith that's exhibited, the power that Jesus does, and it calls us to faith in him. It calls us to believe because here, here's the thing. If we took this whole story and we changed the crisis and that's the only thing we changed, the story would be the same. If we changed the storm to an earthquake, if we changed the storm to a tornado, if we changed the storm to somebody getting cancer, if we changed the storm to something really bad happening, the story remains the same and the point remains the same, that it all points to Jesus' power and the call for us to trust in him. Because when it comes down to it, Jesus showed his power and exposed the fact that we should trust him. Tonight, we're going to see how far we get. Uh, we might get through all this. I just want to look at six biblical truths that stand out in this passage. Biblical truths that draw us to this understanding of who Jesus is and why we should trust him. First is this. Our everyday circumstances of life are filled with God's working. Our everyday circumstances of life are filled with God's working. Verses 35, 36, 37, this is what happens. Evening came, and Jesus himself tells his disciples, hey, let's get in the boat. We're going to go across the, the way here. We're going to go to the other side. And by the way, we find out in chapter 5, when they get to the other side, this is where they are meeting this man with um, that, is, uh, that is legion, that is uh, possessed with all the demons. There's, a, there's, a congru there's, a, there's something going on there. It's something that is important to the next step in Jesus' life. But Jesus is saying, let's do something normal. Let's take the boat and go to the other side. The crowd was all around him. Let's go to this other country with this flotilla of people around them. And then in verse 37... Suddenly, everything goes upside down. There's a great windstorm. The, the wording in the Greek talks about hurricane-type hurricane winds, mega winds, if you want to get down to it. The waves were breaking up on the boat. The boat was filling. Anybody ever been in a, in a situation like that where you're in a boat and there's a storm? Was it fun? <laughs> fun is not the right word, right? It was a little bit scary, I'm guessing. When, when, when were you there? And what, what all happened? Deep sea fishing, 50 miles offshore, and a squall on a small boat. Oh, was anybody sleeping? Nobody was sleeping. <laughs> boat was struck by lightning twice. Oh, goodness. Uh, no electronics. Yeah, it was nip and tuck. Okay. So everybody remember that. Uh, if anybody wants to go fishing with Marshall? <laughs> on shore, stay, lightning rod, something like that. Uh, it, it came up and 
I'm um, still here, so I'm about to he is still here. So, so never mind. If somebody is going fishing, call Marshall and say, "Can you come with us?" Um, it, it's scary. It is a. It was a scary and very very real event. Boat was already filling. Seasoned sailors and fishermen suddenly found themselves in the storm unlike anything that they experienced. Now, here's the crucial point. Here's the thing that I want us to realize. Jesus led them into the storm. Go back up. Jesus was, let's get into the boat. Let's go. Let's get in and let's go. And Jesus was the one that led them into the storm. I'm going to harp on this for a bit because it is worth saying. It maddens me to no end to hear preachers that are on TV or on the internet or even in pulpits start talking about the idea that, oh, follow God and everything's going to be all rosy and perfect in your life and you're going to be healthy, and you're going to be wealthy, and you're going to prosper, and your job's going to be all good, and your family's going to be healthy, and nothing is going to ever be bad. That is a lie. God will bring storms and trials and difficulties into your life if it is for your benefit, for his will, for his glory, for his purpose. Got a normal evening, nothing out of the ordinary. It ended in a severe crisis. And it wasn't accidental. It wasn't a surprise to God. It didn't catch Jesus off guard. I stole this line, but it was a good one. When we're talking about our own life, we should not be surprised by surprises in our lives. Let me say that again. We should not be surprised by surprises in our lives. Because what's one thing that is completely consistent in our life? Surprises. You never know what's coming next. 2020, you know, they, that, I mean, that was, that was about as good of an example. We didn't know what was coming. We don't know what's going to come tomorrow, right? But if we know that about life, the surprises of our life should not surprise us. They are divinely ordained moments whereby God is working in the everyday circumstances of our lives to reveal who he is, who we are, and who we need. Trials and tribulations, difficulties and desperate moments are often the time God does his greatest work in our lives. Um, I, I remember, I know I've told this before, Grace having her surgery on her back. You know, that was a surprise in our life. But you know what? It was through that that I got to actually minister to other people that I got to call and talk to that were going through the same thing. And I was able to encourage them and help them. That was something that there was no other way to get prepared for except through that. It is through those acts that God, God uses crises. He uses storms. And through that, a lot of times we grow in our faith. How many of you have ever um, talked to somebody that said, you know what? That was the moment in my life I hit rock bottom. Anybody ever heard that saying before? Anybody, uh, anybody ever talked to somebody a recovering alcoholic, somebody recovering from drugs? Um, they, they will tell a story a lot of times, they'll hit rock bottom. What do they mean when they hit rock bottom? There you go. Rock bottom. Rock bottom's. It was the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. Like, I can't get any lower, and I got... Oh. And I can't get back up again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm, I'm done. I've talked to people that have gone through that, 
And that rock bottom area meant I can't get any lower because there's only one way, and that's, that's up. It's through that horrible, terrible, brought so low place that they figure out, wait a minute, it, it's from here that I can go up. And God used it. The pain, the suffering, the difficulty to help somebody finally stand again. Don't forget, if God doesn't act, then we won't grow. We wouldn't know of salvation. We couldn't be saved unless God himself acted first. We won't mature. So what do we learn from this? Let me give you three things. First, look for God to work up. Uh, look for God at work around you daily. Look for God at work around you daily. Um, it, it's hard to forget God at work in your life when you're constantly looking for him to work. When you get out up in the morning and you see a beautiful sunrise and you're like, man, that's, that's God's creation just awakening in the morning. Or you're looking for God to work within the hearts and lives of other people. Um, how many of y'all have uh, had, had that, that little thing? You bought a new car. Let's say you bought a new yellow car. And what do you see everywhere you drive? Yellow yeah, car. Because you're in one, you've seen one, and you're like, oh, there's a car like mine, there's a car like mine, there's a car like mine. I guarantee you, when you go home tonight, I don't care if it's dark or not, you're going to see a yellow car. <laughs> when we look for God at work, we're going to find him at work. That's one of the things. We've got to have our eyes open. We've got to be looking. Second is this. Listen for God's teaching with all of your senses. Listen for God's teaching with all your senses. It doesn't always come through our ears. Sometimes it comes through a touch, through pain. It, it comes with our um, eyes. We see the consequences of doing something good or doing something bad. We see it when a family interacts and, and they're praying together. There's lessons that are there. Or sometimes we, we see it other ways. Um, I, I watched a little snippet, I think, on Instagram once where it was a, a son or a daughter talking to their dad and they said, Dad, preach on the spot. And the dad was like, the game was he had to look around and go, okay, I got to find something and I got to preach about it. And they were right behind a, uh, a propane, um, it was a gas logs. And he said, oh, there it is. So the gas logs, the reason why these are burning is it's got a fuel source. If you don't have a fuel source, you're not going to burn. Well, we in our own lives will burn brightly for God, but we've got to make sure that we're replenished with the Word. We've got to be close to Him in prayer. We've got to be ones that are well-rested. Well we've got to have good minds. Otherwise, we won't have that fuel, and we'll, we'll burn out. We've got to constantly be, be doing that. And I thought, man, that's, that's pretty good. What was he doing? He was looking around, saying, man, where's a lesson from God in this? What is God teaching me with everything that I see, with everything that I, I hear all around me? Also this, learn a little bit more each day. Learn a little bit more each day. And looking and listening, learn a little bit more about God each day. Renew the knowledge. It might be you learned something that you already knew. Because it's hard to drift from God when constant learning is going on. By the way, if we, if we have that too, we learn a little bit more about God, you know what's a great conversation starter? Guess what I learned today? You pick a child up from school. What inevitably do you ask? You ask, how did their day go? What did you learn today? And what do they usually say? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Every once in a while, I have something, and you're like, okay. But isn't it good to be able to say that? Learn something new. 
Why? Because in our everyday circumstances of life, they are filled with God's working. But notice also this. Jesus, who is God the Son, is human and sinless. Jesus, who is God the Son, is human and sinless. The beginning part of verse 38, that he, being Jesus, was in the stern, asleep, on the cushion. The Bible affirms this, the church has affirmed this for centuries, that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. It's part of the, the Trinity. That Jesus uh, has two natures united in one person. If you want a $5 word, that's called the hypostatic union. He's 100% divine, 100% human. I can't explain it, but that is the way Scripture puts it. He is the God-man. The only qualification that needs to be made related to his humanity is that he is without sin. That he has no sin nature. That he's never sinned a single sin. Let me give you two texts that, that show that. First is 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. By the way, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that is called the great exchange. The Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might have the righteousness of God. The exchange was made. Hebrews 4 and verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Both his humanity and deity are put in display in this story as he shows his power. But in his humanity that appears so clearly in verse 38, amazingly, even astonishingly, he's in the stern of the boat, fast asleep on a cushion. And the Bible exposes so many places that the Lord is human. He got hungry, fasted 40 days. He got angry, Mark 3 and verse 5. He cried in John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. On the cross, he died, and here we see him sleeping. By the way, you mark your Bibles. In all that we have of Jesus, this is the only place that we see that he slept. He slept right through the storm. There are other places where he arose early and we knew we were sleeping, but this is the only place that he specifically, it says, he slept. Jesus had the sound machine turned on to a thunderstorm. <laughs> he is human, but there's something else. As he was in that boat, as he was asleep, he had pure and utter confidence in the providential care of his heavenly Father. He was asleep. I'll give you a good example of that. How many of y'all have ever fallen asleep in the car, not in front of the wheel, but in a passenger seat. Anybody ever fallen asleep before like that? Who was driving? You. Me. Well, I, that's yes. <laughs> Given. Who who, uh, who who was driving? Was Dyke driving? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Who was who was driving? Linda driving? Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Y'all tell me if I'm wrong. You trusted those people, right? Please say yes. <laughs> I bet you everybody has took on that. think about it. <laughs> um, so, you trust the people because you're like, you know, they're driving, but hey, I can snooze, right? <laughs> yes. We were in the grand, driving around in the Grand Canyon. And a friend of ours was driving, and he could sleep with his eyes open. Oh, wow. And Charles had to keep his eye on him constantly. Because he could. He, could. he was asleep, and his eyes were open. So you couldn't tell unless, unless you were, like, really, like, kind of asking him some stuff. And, oh, that'd be kind of, that would weird you out a little bit. 
So did he have to like intentionally close his eyes to make sure you know he went to sleep and it would close up? He would eventually, but you know, it's difficult to tell when he was. That's when you need to start playing a card game or something like that. Wow. Oh, wow. When, when we're talking about sleeping in a car, you trust the driver. That or you're, you're beyond exhausted, but you trust the driver. The same is true in our lives. Life's a whole lot easier when we have that trust and that faith in the one bringing us through the trials and the circumstances. Life is easier when we understand, hey, God is in control. Lottie Moon, the Southern Baptist patron saint of missions, said this, We are immortal until our work on earth is finished. Jesus knew he had a work to complete on the cross, and he was confident in his father's promise to see him finish his work. So here's the question. Why in the world make this point? Why make this point about the deity of Christ? I'll say this. It is vital for us in our ministry as Christians. The point of this passage is to help us answer two of the great questions the greatest questions really anyone can ever ask. Ones every Christian should be able to answer. The first is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And a lot of people think, well, Jesus is a good prophet. Muslims believe Jesus is a good prophet. And, and there is a correctness there. Jesus is the greatest of prophets. People believe also, hey, Jesus is a good teacher, and he is a good teacher. He's a good man. He is. But you know what? That misses his greatness by a billion miles. Because he is the God-man, the Savior. He is the one in all power, in, in whom all authority resides. He is the one who made the great exchange, who lived the sinless life, who died in our place, he is the one that we trust. Which that's the other great question. Who is Jesus and why should I trust him? Here's the answer in this passage. In him all power resides. In him all wisdom is given. In him is the greatest character that has ever been shown, the greatest trust that's ever been given. All love is always shown in his life. He's greater than all others, and he has power over all. This passage helps us answer that. Who is Jesus? Well, let me show you. Let me show you as the one who is 100% human, but 100% God. By the way, it, it goes to the, the third greatest question, if you want to write that down. How do I trust in Jesus? And believing on him and placing your trust in him in proclaiming him as Lord. This is an important point to make. But we also see this. When we lose faith in the one we should trust, panic will be present in our lives. When we lose faith in the one we should trust, panic will be present in our lives. Uh, how many of y'all have... Uh, Ever lost their cell phone before? It don't feel good, does it? Um, what do you usually do when you lose your cell phone? Call it. Call it. Have somebody call it. Have somebody call it. Um, that's always a good one. You know, I've uh, I've encountered youth that have lost their cell phones, and um, guess what? Their phone is set on silent. Silent. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Do you know what I say to that? If you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. <laughs> oh that was a good dad joke right there. So if you ever know somebody like that, you can just say that little line, they'll get it. Um, it kind of it freaks you out. You know, oh no, I don't know where my cell phone is. 
I, I've had a I've had a moment and a half too. I've been actually looking at looking for my cell phone in the pulpit, knowing full well it's right there, broadcasting the live stream. That's just you know part of my brain not working at the moment. Panic ensued. Verse thirty eight. And they, the disciples, woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Verse 38 records a very normal human reaction. The disciples, in a panic, woke up Jesus. Interestingly, Mark's gospel calls him teacher. Matthew's gospel, they say Lord. In Luke's gospel, they record them saying, Master, Master. Most likely, they all said this and a whole lot more. Probably things they didn't want to be putting in scriptures. These are terms of respect and honor. But the question they fire his way is not. Do you care that we are perishing? Their comfort and their well-being was at stake. The boat was rocking. Their life wasn't happy and go lucky anymore. Therefore, they questioned Jesus' love and concern for them. We don't have to do that, right? Some we would never, ever do. Let's be honest. A lot of times, we are too hard on the disciples and the main reason being is we see so much of ourselves in them. They were frustrated by what appeared to be indifference to their plight. They ignored the fact he was asleep. They lash out in a rude outburst rather than exhibit faith in the one who has proven himself trustworthy again and again. By the way, when we read this passage, it ought to pain us a little bit because we see ourselves here because we ourselves do the same thing. Something goes wrong in our life. We get a phone call we don't like. Something happens in our life. A tragedy occurs. A storm is there. A trial comes. We, we have something bad happen. And what do we do? We go to God and say, God, don't you care about me? <coughs> God, why do you hate me? The reality is, is that Jesus has proven himself faithful to us over and over and over again. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the great Baptist preachers, said this, God is too wise to err, too good to be unkind. <coughs> Leave off doubting him, and begin to trust him. For in so doing, you put a crown on his head. Let me give you two things. The application of, of what's going on here. Two prayers that I think would do good when we face trials. The first is this. Lord, help me not fume, but rather let me have faith. Let me not fume, but rather let me have faith. To be honest, that's usually what happens. Something bad happens, we get mad. <laughs> I heard about all of the things in Texas, and I got mad. I mean, I, honestly, I, I get mad when things like that happen. But you know, my anger won't do too much. But you know what? My faith will. The prayer there is for faith to avoid the fuming. The second is this, and I think it's something that we can all take to heart. Lord, help me take the advice that I would give to others. Lord, help me take the advice that I would give to others. Um, I have a couple of Alexa devices at the house. And they're great for figuring out what time is, or setting a timer, or asking umpteen different questions, dropping in. It's like an intercom in the house. Um, but you can do something called having a flash briefing. And the flash briefing is pretty cool because um, what it'll do is it'll give you like 
the weather, a daily Bible verse, it'll give you the news, it'll give you nearly about anything you want, but one of the things that I wanted is, I wanted some good news in the morning. I wanted something positive. And there's something called everyday positivity. <coughs> and I found it in the very, very first little lesson. It was just, uh, it's a, a British or an Australian lady and it's just talking about good little things you can do that day. The very first one she talked about was, what advice do you give that you yourself need to take? Think about this passage. Think about the advice you would give to the disciples. Every one of us in here could give an amazing sermon. 18 different things you would say to the disciples that the disciples should have done. Bible verses the disciples should have, have uh, looked to and reminded themselves of. Things to say to Jesus, not, don't you care we're perishing. But you know what? Every bit of that advice is things we ourselves need to take. Maybe the mindset we need to take in trials is what would I tell someone else who was in my exact situation? Let's crown him in faith, not doubt him in unbelief. Crown him in faith, not doubt him in unbelief. Now, that's the halfway mark. And I don't think we all want to go till 8 o'clock, or 8.30, excuse me. Anybody want to be here till 8.30? I don't know if my voice is going to last that long, because it's 7.55 right now. So I'm going to cut it off, and I'll probably make a video of the rest um, and, and do that for live stream. Um, but I'm going to stop right there. Questions, comments, observations, other applications we can make. Well, let's bow in a word of prayer and give thanks to the Lord for what we've learned tonight and how we've grown. And ask the Lord's blessings throughout the rest of this week. Father, as we've gone forward into this passage, we didn't get all the way, but we got a good ways. And, and Lord, so much we can learn. I pray that you would help us. We know trials are always going to come in our life. We know that there will be difficulties, there will be challenges, there will be struggles that we will all face. And I pray that we would take the little lessons that we learned here tonight and apply them into our hearts. Lord, we know the main thing is looking to you. We know you can calm our storms, but even more importantly is in knowing that you are God, that you have power overall, and from that we gain our peace, we gain our trust, we gain the ability to rest in the midst of the storms. I pray now that you guide us and direct us. I pray that you would bless us throughout the rest of this week. I pray that you would watch out over our youth and our children as they take their finals and their end of grade testings. Help them through these days ahead. Give us safety now as we leave this place. Let us go forth as your ambassadors. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much.